It is because of the Lord's great love for us that we are not consumed. Great is your faithfulness. Your mercies are new every morning, including this morning. Amen. Fellow believers in Christ Jesus, I'm sure you're following this, but this week begins the regular NBA season. What difference will that make in your life? Well, that depends. Are you a fair weather fan or are you a diehard fan? If you haven't purchased Suns merchandise since 2021 when they went up against the Milwaukee Bucks in the championship, then you are a fair weather fan. I admit I, I'm a fair weather fan. Why spend time and energy cheering for a team that's just a bunch of losers? Life is too short for that. When it comes to spiritual matters, however, God doesn't want fair weather fans. He wants people who are all in. As we continue and conclude our sermon series in the life of Joshua, we'll see that putting God first at all times and in every circumstance really leads to blessing. Listen to the words of our text as they're recorded in Joshua chapter 24, reading selected verses. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors. Your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So far, our text. Joshua, the leader of the Israelites, was now nearly 110 years old. He had led the Israelites into the promised land. The time had come to share with his fellow Israelites, his last will and testament. And he instructed that all the people should gather to him at Shechem. This was a smart choice, not just because, as you can tell from the map, that it was a central location. It was also here, hundreds of years earlier, that Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, had gathered his family, and he said to them, Now put away the idols you brought with from Uncle Laban's. We're going to bury them right here. We're making a clean break with our past and a new beginning. Joshua wanted the same thing to happen there as well. And all the people came. Joshua must have been excited about the turnout the way a preacher loves to see a full church. But Joshua knew that their presence alone did not mean that these Israelites were dedicated to the Lord. These were the same people, after all, who 40 years earlier had stood at the foot of Mount Sinai, had heard God's commands related to them or relayed to them through Moses, and they had said with one voice, we will do everything the Lord commanded. How long did that last? When Moses and Joshua went back up Mount Sinai, 40 days passed, just over a month, 
And the people gave up on the God of Israel, and they said, we need to make for ourselves other gods. And so they built that golden calf. Forty days is all that it took. Okay, be honest. How long did it take for your mind to start wandering since the start of this service? Forty seconds? And does it continue to wander every 40 seconds? It's pretty astounding to hear Joshua say to the people, get rid of the idols that you brought with from Egypt. Really? They brought with them idols from Egypt? After they had seen everything that God did for them, parting of the Red Sea, and then causing those very waters to come crashing down on the Egyptians, why would you want to worship their God? Fellow believers, what are the idols that you are still carrying around? Relying on your intellect? I'm smart, got a 4.0, I'm going to go to a good college. That will give me a good job, that will give me lots of money. Yeah, I am smart, I've started my own business. I think got retirement all planned out. Whenever we rely on anything other than our God to get ahead in life, we show that we are like these Israelites, carrying idols. Listen carefully again to what Joshua said to his people. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worship beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Don't just set aside those gods for a time. Throw them away. So my pride as I think about how smart I am. Or maybe you're a workout nut and you take pride that you spend an hour in the gym every day or out on the trails or that you eat well and why can't other people do the same thing? There wouldn't be so much sickness in this world. I mean, come on, people. When we think like that, it's good to remember what the Apostle Paul once said. Physical training is of some value. But godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. It doesn't matter much if I can run a fast mile or 50 miles if I'm not running well the race to heaven with Jesus. Where do I spend my time and energy? Just trying to get along the best that I can? Or am I relying on Jesus? Joshua was sarcastic when he said to the Israelites, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. If I were to paraphrase what Joshua was saying, if you don't want to feed from the banquet of God's promises, then choose if you're going to eat from the garbage dump of the Amorites and their gods, or from the manure pile of the Canaanites. Those are really the choices that are left for us, too. If we don't want God, then what are we left with? Nothing. But Joshua warned the people. He said, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. Even when we do our very best to put God first, 
we fail time and time again, don't we? Why then should God call us his children, much less his servants? Because this is not just a God who demands, this is a God who also delivers. Let me say that again. This is not just a God who demands. This is a God who delivers. Literally delivering his son to us, Jesus, who is like that kind stranger who stops by when they see you broken down on I-17. And they come to see what the matter is. They not only diagnose the problem, they get into their car and they go to the auto parts store, buy the parts that are needed to fix the problem. And then they get their hands all greasy and their clothes all dirty as they fix the problem. Why, you just stand there unable to do anything because you don't have the first clue about auto mechanics. And then when you try to press money into that person's hand to thank them, they refuse and say, actually, I have something else for you. And they give you this pass, which gives you gas, free gas for the rest of your life. Is that not Jesus, the Son of God, who did not come to earth just to diagnose our problem? That wouldn't help us out very much. We need someone to fix the problem. And he got all the right parts through his perfect life. He got his hands literally filthy with blood. But it wasn't filthy blood, it was blood that cleanses. And then he says, oh, by the way, I will be with you to the very end of the age. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The things that you need today, I'll provide those things. And then when we get to tomorrow, I'll provide the things that you need for tomorrow. Do we really have such an awesome God? Absolutely, said Joshua. He declared to the people, you know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. Go ahead, let Satan say that following the God of the Bible, that just makes you into a bunch of slaves. That is not true. Following the God of the Bible brings release and relief and a certain hope for the future. It makes us want to say, how do I follow this God? And Joshua says, I'm glad you asked. Serve the Lord with all faithfulness. What he literally said there is serve the Lord in all truth and sincerity. Let's focus on those two words, truth and sincerity. Following God in all truth means that you don't say to yourself, I think I know what God wants. I feel it within me. I prayed about this decision, and I feel good about it, therefore God must be okay with it. Well, what you should first do is to say, God, what have you said? Let me listen to your word and let me compare it to how I feel. Now, before you pat yourself on the back because you're saying, well, I know the word of God. I follow him in truth. Ask yourself the next question. Do I follow him in all sincerity? In other words, do I do the right thing for the right reason? As I stood in the entryway this morning greeting you as you came in, I don't think I saw a frown or any grumpiness, though um, Robert, baby Caleb was a little grumpy this morning, but we'll let that slide. But you adults and children, you know this is church. I need to be happy and shiny because I love Jesus. 
But were there some people that you saw that you made judgments? Why are they wearing that? And I don't really want to talk to that person because, well, they make my life difficult at school, at work, within the congregation. That's not serving the Lord in all sincerity. Serving the Lord in all sincerity says, yeah, I'm surrounded by a bunch of sinners and I'm one of them. And look, God has given me the opportunity to show patient love and to forgive. Is this going to be easy to do? Of course it isn't. That's why Jesus once said, take up your cross and follow me. Taking up your cross means dying daily to your sinful nature's impulse to just live for yourself and steer clear, clear of others. But Joshua gives us a better way, reminding us that we have a God who first served us. When I lived in Canada, I remember watching a Canadian sitcom that had a, a character who was a pathetic Christian. In one of the episodes, he said, sure, I'm a Christian, but I don't let it affect my life. Today, God reminds us he does not want Christians in name only. He wants Christians here in our hearts. And he reminds us that this is a God who does not let any of his promises fall flat. And so we can respond as did the Israelites. Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations who live in the land. We, too, will serve the Lord because he is our God. Their God is also our God. Have faith to put him first in all matters. You won't be sorry that you did so. God promises his blessings now and forever. Amen.